All right, so um, we're still doing the recap of kind of the things we looked at last year. <clears throat> it's kind of like a finished work crash course. So like I always say every week, the more in-depth teaching that you'll want, um, that's on our YouTube channel. And you can reach that. That's youtube.com forward slash the grace platform. Um, and in each of the description boxes of the videos is where all the like extensive notes that I used to preach are. So, <clears throat> sorry. Everything I'm saying tonight, if you want to kind of go in depth, more in depth, um, yeah, you can find all the notes and stuff there. So last week, we kind of ended it looking at the New Nature series, or re-looking at the New Nature series. And we were just going over the fact that, you know, that something in us has now changed, that we have come into the redeemed image and likeness that we've lost, you know, in, in the fall of Adam. And so we have Christ who comes as the second or the last Adam um, to undo what kind of the first Adam did, the damage of the first Adam, and to bring us into something even greater than what we ever were in Adam, right? Um, we always talk about how, it's, and it, I don't know why Christians love it so much, but it's almost like we want something to be wrong with us. You know, you hear it in church all the time, oh, the heart is wicked, and don't trust yourself and da, 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 da. it's like no 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 something we have we have God in us you know um, <clears throat> God is happy pleased to live in us you know this isn't we're not worms or any of that stuff so we spent a little bit of time kind of correcting that not just making us realize that we're not that bad but also making us realize that we are really good because those two things aren't the same some people may Yes, they will tell you, yeah, no, I'm not a sinner anymore. Yeah, I'm a saint. But when we kind of explore what it means to be a saint and just how deep that goes, uh, they get uncomfortable. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to be exploring a little bit today. Just going back to that. So where we left off last week was we were, you know, we were talking about holiness. Um, and it's really interesting. I was thinking about holiness the other week because if you've been in our clubhouses, you've heard people talk about the holiness of God like all the time. It was so annoying. I'm not saying that God being holy is annoying, but the way that we talk about it definitely is. Um, we have this, Christians have this obsession with God's holiness, almost like it's his highest attribute. Um, and people will say that, so some people will say stuff like, oh, well, all his attributes are the same. There's not one that's more than the other, but the one they'll always talk about is, well, God is holy. And that's why they did it. God is holy. Therefore, he can't do this. And he can't because he's holy. So it's like, okay, clearly to you, you have a, you have a system and you wait you weigh holiness above the rest, right? Um, <clears throat> now, what's really interesting, and I only realized this the other day, is um, obviously here at the platform, we are very Christocentric, so our understanding of God is completely derived from Jesus, first and foremost, right? He is the ultimate expression of what the Father is like. So if we want to understand what the Father's like, we look at Jesus. And it's really interesting is when we look at Jesus, he doesn't mention holiness. I don't know why it took me so long to clock it. I really like tried to think about a scripture where Jesus said anything about be holy as I'm holy, something about be being holy, something about the Father being holy. He just didn't say it. So why have we made such a big deal out of this holiness thing when God comes down himself and doesn't do that? If we're going to get our priorities right, let's align them with the priorities of God that Jesus revealed, right? And the thing that Jesus talks about way more is love. And that's how we understand in this message um, God's highest attribute, as it were, right? That love is how we frame God. So <clears throat> with that in mind, when we then reframe holiness in this light, um, it's easier to unpack and digest some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at, right? And so where we ended last week was the idea that we are just as holy as God the Father. And that's something that a lot of Christians can't handle because, one, we have a misunderstanding of what holiness is, and two, a lot of us have been trained in sin consciousness. So because we link holiness to sin which it isn't um, but we do that therefore when we think of holiness we 
basically just think it's sinlessness and therefore because God has never sinned and God can't sin, we can't be as holy as him because we can sin. And it's like, okay, but there's Jesus. Right, remember, we're Christians here. We follow Christ and Jesus is fully God, fully man. Jesus is God with the potential, the ability to sin. Now, we know he doesn't sin, but we see Jesus tempted in scripture. Sin is very much a possibility. God puts on a body that allows him to experience the same temptations that we go through and it is because of that that we're able to overcome and that's kind of Hebrews goes into that um, but we're not going to go into that today but we have Jesus who comes and he because he's fully God he retains that same level of holiness that the father has but he has it in a human body so the very idea that we have that well you know God is so holy that no flesh can look upon mm, hold on that same holiness that God has, he managed to put it into a human body. Now, Jesus' body as he walked the earth in the incarnation was no less human or no more divine than you or I. Our bodies were just like his. And what that then means is our bodies can contain that same holiness. And they do. Right? Holiness isn't just a thing we talk about it like it's like an abstract thing just some ethereal part of god but paul grounds us in understanding what holiness is and this is what we looked at last week but we're gonna look at it again just to give us a little bit of context for where we're going so let's go to this first corinthians 1 and um, verse 30 if you haven't been here before we read all together in the nkjv uh, and when we're in stratford we read out loud without well when we're in stratford and we don't have masks on it's been so long. Can you not imagine? It's been almost it's been almost a year since lockdown. It's crazy. So first Corinthians chapter one verse thirty reads But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now that word sanctification is Holiness. Sanctification is holiness. It's the same word. And so we read this again and we understand that that says he became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, and holiness, and redemption. And so we see that holiness is not just a thing. Holiness is a person. And if Jesus is our holiness, if he is our holiness, then that means our holiness is the same as the Father's. Because our holiness is not us based on what we do or anything like that. Our holiness is based on the person, in the person of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't have some half-baked patchwork holiness. Jesus has the fullness of holiness. The same holiness that the Father has is what Jesus has. And because that's our holiness, we have that same thing. Right? So, this is actually quite cool. Um, and I think I said this last week. That it seems like people... I mean, I feel like even if you told them there is righteousness the Father, they still would maybe... They'd still be a little bit... Uh, but because that one's so plain in Scripture, you can't really argue with it. Um, I mean, people swallow it easier. But it's the same with holiness. There's no difference. The very thing that makes us the righteousness of God is the same thing that makes us the holiness of God. Jesus. If Jesus is our righteousness and Jesus is our holiness, then we are in him the righteousness and the holiness of God. Which is amazing. Um, so what we're going to go to now is Ephesians 4. And verse... 24 I think Ephesians 4 24 my first here we have Paul talk about the new man and this is what he says we put on the new man which was created according to God in 
true righteousness and holiness. Again, we see that link in him. Holiness, righteousness. Same. He is the holiness. He is the righteousness. Therefore, they are of that same level. And I like how it says true righteousness and true holiness. It's not some half-baked patchwork or where not really quite as holy as the Father is we're like a lesser verse no we are as holy as the Father is right um I remember a Platts video on our, it's on our Instagram if you don't follow us on Instagram at the G platform go follow that F you're here I need to get on to you I beg you post um <laughs> videos please because we content has been ages anyway so I remember saying that if we started to see ourselves this way so because everybody has this huge obsession with God's holiness and God is so holy you can't look upon sin blah 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 if we realize that that is the same holiness that we have we would live our lives a totally different way because we would understand that the same relationship that God has to sin we have to sin we are in him now dead to sin we are in him alive sin has no power no dominion no hold no place on us in us around us we are sin free right and as we acknowledge that then we can walk in that but for a lot of us we struggle with even seeing ourselves that way because it just seems so far-fetched because you know we've been trained to see just sin everything's about sin someone tweeted today I saw on Twitter or last night or an American person tweeted about you know uh, why they're staying away from sex or you know why they're abstaining from sex because it's something about it will send you to hell it's like oh my god obviously the people that are in the message started replying like no that's not true and you know it's uh, unbelief sends people to hell whatever but that is it's just an example of what's being preached from the pulpit sin not Christ not the victory of Christ over sin but sin and so everything's about behaviour modification and you've got to live this way we have to live this way we have to live right we have to do that and it's like well hold on let's get the basics let's get things straight let's get first things first Jesus what he's done who we are in him Let's have that foundation. Let's ground ourselves in that. That's what Paul literally does here in this passage. In Ephesians 4. From verse 20, he starts talking about, well, this is who you are in Christ. You have not so learned Christ. You've been taught by him. Verse 22, you've put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. You've already put him off. You're not him anymore. You've been renewed in the spirit of your mind and you've put on the new man or you've sunk into the new man, depending on translate it this is what's already done and then in verse 25 through then he starts speaking about well this is how that behave that's this is how this is what that behavior looks like put away lying don't sin blah 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 right that's what he starts saying but that foundation comes from the fact that we are new creations who are holy and righteous and therefore because of what Christ has done because we've been made holy and righteous we now can live this way so that's Ephesians 4 Let's go to holiness as a concept and understanding what it really is, right? So, like I mentioned before, for a lot of us, we grew up with the idea that holiness has everything to do with sin. And it's just about being, I don't know, contrary to sin or um, abstaining from sin or being perfect or sinless. And that's kind of the way that we saw it. Um, interestingly enough that's just not in the Bible there's no definition like that in scripture Um, and when we look into the Greek the word hagiazo just means to be set apart and that's all it means now understanding this helps us deal with another particular doctrine that I'm really not a fan of and that's called progressive sanctification 
and and that's the teaching that we are made holy over time but not there's like there will it's super annoying because it's uh, it's double mindedness because they will look at all the scriptures that call us outright holy now and say yeah 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 I agree with that I believe that amen but we're becoming holy and so hold on if we aren't how are we becoming it because we already are it um and again, if we have just the right understanding of what holiness is, we, we can put these things to bed. The word sanctification, the word in the Greek, hagiazo, as we just said, all it means is to be set apart. There's nothing more. It's not to be set apart over time. It's not, uh, you know, to become holy over time, to become holier. None of that. All it is is to be set apart and when we understand that then we get to see holiness for what it really is um, <clears throat> just to show you in scripture how holiness is not given a time frame uh, we'll go through a few so we'll go to 1 Timothy 4 and we'll read verses 4 to 5 1 Timothy 4 verses 4 to 5 and it reads for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer now if holiness were this you know this uh, thing that took a lot of time or some sort of process Here's the other thing that I hate about this holiness sanctification process teaching is that none of us ever seem to reach the end. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 we're, being, we're made holy over time, but no one ever reaches. Like, those people, if someone would say, oh, I've made, I'm, you know, I'm holy, I'm fully holy, though, no, you're not. And it's like, what kind of process is it? Why does it never end? Our food in this scripture, you know, let's talk about food. Food is not sanctified over time. It's not like you pray over your food and as you eat it, it gets holier and holier. No. You pray over the food, you bless it once, and that's it, it's done. Job done. Right? That's the same way it works with, with our holiness. It's not that it's taking time. It's not that you know this is some process we've got to go through and we've got to... now what's also super annoying about this doctrine is they mix and match with some other stuff so obviously last week we looked at the fact that the new nature is in us um, we're not the old man the old man has been crucified he's totally dead gone never to return um, Paul called to you know he describes it as the circumcision of the flesh so the old man who's been cut completely removed cut off destroyed through the death of Christ Christ died as the old man he crucified the old man um, and that is the self that needed to die it's now dead in Christ unfortunately we've taught for the most part excuse me in the church we've taught that the old man is not dead We've taught that there is some part of you that still needs to die. And we've pulled from random verses, um, pulled them out of context and buttressed this. And we looked at some of those last week, like, you know, you hear people say, well, I die daily. What did Paul mean by I die daily? And it's like, okay. If we take that in context, we see that Paul was speaking about the persecution he faced nothing to do with his flesh and killing his flesh every day that's not the journey of a Christian this is not I call it suicide squad Christianity that's not what we've been called to live we died once done deal and now we live the life as in Jesus didn't say I've come to bring death 
or abundant death. He said he came to bring life. And that's what we have in Christ. It is a life, life more abundantly. It's all about life, 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 life. That is the Christian. This whole thing is about us experiencing and living out the life, the Zoe, the eternal life of God. It's not about us dying to this, or dying to that, or dying to self, or dying to none of that. We are alive in him. That is the language of this covenant. The old man has been done away with. We don't need to mention him again. We are now alive in Christ, living in that way, right? That's just one example, one verse. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of others. So in Luke 11, verse 2, we have it used again. You guys recognize this? prayed it in school growing up. I know I did. We used to do every Friday assembly. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed, now that word hallowed is the same as sanctified, which is the same as to be made holy, right? So that's, may your name be holy. That's what hallowed be your name means. Obviously, then your kingdom come, will be done, and obviously it's in heaven. But we're going to focus on that hallowed thing. Now, God's name is not being made holy over time. God's name is holy. Right? His name is sanctified. It's not becoming more, it's not becoming purer and purer as the days go by, as the ages go by. No. It's always been. That's what it is. Um, now, what's interesting is there used to be, kind of in the Methodist days, early Methodist days, so John Wesley era, um, they used to believe in, I think they called it old or entire, entire sanctity that was the doctrine um, and they basically believed it was like a second work of the spirit post salvation maybe even post spirit baptism I don't remember but anyway um, they believed that and it's yeah I mean they were they were like halfway there it's just they didn't connect it to the cross they connected it to their own efforts so it was like alright when you spend a certain amount of time in prayer you reach a point where then you fully died, you're fully sanctified, but you have to reach that, you have to do something to reach that point. Whereas now we understand <clears throat> that it's not about what we do. What we do does not make us who we are. What Christ has done is what makes us who we are. And so because he is our holiness, he is our righteousness, right, as we read, that then means is who we are that it's done um, it's not being done over time it's not being done by our prayer the entire sanctification isn't linked to your prayer life or your devotion life or your how much you fast or anything like that it is linked to the entirely sanctified one and that is Jesus Christ Let me give one more example. So Matthew 23. We'll read 16 and 17. I don't want to read the rest of it. Um, so here you have Jesus get onto the Pharisees. mess and myth I said myth anyway um, he's getting onto the Pharisees it's nothing new it's standard Jesus stuff and he says to them woe to you blind guys who say whoever swears by the temple it is nothing but whoever swears by the gold of the temple he is obliged to perform it fools and blind for which is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold now if we put on our progressive sanctification hat then it's like okay that should mean that 
you put the gold in the temple and then as the longer you leave it in the temple the holier it gets well that's weird no that's not true it's not how it works it's the holy you want to in the temple same with us we have the holy spirit living in us we are holy that's it done um now obviously I keep mentioning that how this holiness happens is because of Christ and what he did. And I'll just show you a couple of scriptures just to back that up. So Hebrews 10, 10. Hebrews 10, 10 reads, by that will, we have been. We have been. Tenses are everything in the epistles. Now to give the reminder. That when we read the epistles, when we read the New Testament, we need to be very, very, very careful about the tenses that we encounter things in. That's how we put things like this to bed. Because so many of the sanctification, holiness scriptures are in the past tense. Why? Because what made us holy happened in the past. And that's what he's speaking of here. We have been sanctified. What? How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. So it's because of what Jesus did. Because of his atoning sacrifice. His death, burial, resurrection. That is what has made us holy. That's what sanctified us. Right? And then uh, same book, Hebrews chapter 13 yes Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 Hebrews 13 and verse 12 and it reads Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Past tense. He suffered outside the gate so that he could sanctify the people with his blood. When did he do that? When his blood was shed. When did that happen? 2,000 years ago. Jesus isn't dying today. His blood is not being shed today. What's done is done. It is the finished work of Christ because Christ has done what needed to be done it is all done Christ has finished it right um, so yeah that's just another verse in Romans 15 you know actually no we're going to do I like this actually so we're going to go there we're going to go to Romans real quick Romans 15 and verse 16. That's a little reminder of who we are. Romans 15, 16. And then we'll talk about kind of how this verse is translated and the interesting conclusions that one may come to. So, Romans 15, 16. Paul says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. The offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So, sanctified by his blood, Jesus' blood, sanctified through Jesus, the offering of his body. Now we also see sanctified by the Spirit. Now what's interesting is in Scripture a lot, we see the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God accomplished a lot of the same things and here's just one example right so sanctification happens by Jesus' blood and it also happens by the spirit we are cleansed by the spirit we're also cleansed by the blood um, there are a few other parallels but yeah it's just really interesting how that is right so we have here that we are sanctified by the spirit now the way that it's crazy because it's the, it's the same words in the same order but depending on you know, maybe where you put punctuation, uh, the words could, like the sentence could have a totally different meaning. So, you could read this as, 
um, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And we can take that to mean, so the Gentiles were giving some sort of offering and we were hoping that would be acceptable to God and that offering, whatever it was they were giving, maybe money, you know, maybe a lamb or whatever, that would be sanctified by the Spirit. And obviously, that in, in terms of how it structured in English makes sense. And we can read it that way. But what I kind of realise is I don't think that's what Paul was getting at. Um, I don't think it was so much Paul was saying that the Gentiles were offering something that Paul wanted to he wanted God to find it acceptable. Um, instead, in the Greek, um, the grammar is in a possessive and subjunctive genitive. Um, so, depending on which one you take, either the offering belongs to the Gentiles, so it's like I keep, like I said before, it's one that they're offering to God, like something they have that they're physically offering, or was made by them um, but there's actually another way of understanding that verse or another way of translating it um, and that's in the appositive genitive that's the Greek what's the word I'm looking for? tense there we go um, and actually it means something different and instead of it reading as the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable they had some sort of offering it now reads more like the offering of the Gentiles as in the Gentiles were the offering themselves which to me is a totally different verse and frames it completely differently because then those same Gentiles who are the offering are also sanctified by the Holy Spirit now why I think this makes more sense is because of Romans 12 now most of us know Romans 12 little bits of it were sinking around in our head um, yeah living sacrifice renew your mind da, 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 great I remember when um, one of our, our brothers in, in the Lord Chetta uh, who's back in Nige now I heard him speak on this verse and it was like huh so I'll read verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service now what's interesting is in loads of versions the word as has been added in and so it would read more as present your bodies as a living sacrifice um, and Cheta pointed out he's like it doesn't say that and I was like wait what and I checked it I was like oh my god wait and obviously I realised that some versions have as other versions don't NKJV is one of the versions that doesn't um, now what, why does this matter is it important here's why because without that word as one it means that our bodies are living sacrifice and well two that just changes everything because it's not like we're now presenting our bodies as something almost like a pretense that it's not really this thing but this is how I'm presenting it no it's actually that we are our bodies are living sacrifices this is what we are our bodies that because think about how it continues on that makes if our bodies are the living sacrifice that means our bodies are holy and acceptable to God this is who we are now you have the people that will say yes you know I agree that we are holy our inner man is holy like the the, the spirit man or, or whatever they want to call him the superman right he's holy he's righteous but little old me normal old me no 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 it can't be me I'm, and then they split it up right so you have the spirit soul body thing and all the good stuff inside is the spirit or maybe the soul and then the body is just sack worthless sack that we just need to get rid of it at the first opportunity we can and that's why Christians are craving the rapture because they want to leave this body you know and enjoy life ever after that's like well that's not how God sees our bodies that's not what we're told here it's not like 
there's some really really bad part of us so yeah the inner man is great but the outer man's rubbish that's Gnosticism that's not Christianity instead we are shown that it's our bodies that are holy and acceptable God is pleased to live in our bodies it doesn't talk about our spirits or our souls or whatever it's the human physical body in its condition he decided to enter that not only did he decide to enter it he enjoyed being there so much so that he's still there now Jesus didn't die and then get rid of his earth suit when he went back he retained it there will forever be a man in the trinity that's what we now have Christ is man's representative before God and you know he's also God's representative before mankind but in that is the fact that God now is a human in Christ it's amazing I remember reading it somewhere I don't remember where the, but they were talking about the incarnation and how it would have been one of the I, I say the first time but essentially yeah it was like they'd never done this before where all of the Godhead was about to enter humanity at the same time because that's what Jesus is we're told in Colossians 2 that in him in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead body so he is the divine HQ I don't know if you're able to mean so that the, you know, the, you know, the divine headquarters um, and so for the first time in history you know God was preparing to, to be in a human body and like live it properly as in he didn't just appear as a man 30 years late he lived a normal life a normal childhood went to school learned to do this learned to do like Jesus lived the ultimate human experience you couldn't get more human than I think about the incarnation I really really enjoy thinking about it it's amazing anyway going back to um, Romans 12 present our bodies a living sacrifice which is what our bodies are wholly acceptable which is your reasonable service now the words which is I don't know which version you have um, but depending on the version you have and the app you have you will see in italics certain words will be italicized and if they're italicized it essentially means that they've been added in and so what we then see is that the word the words which is in this particular version have been added in and so it made me wonder what if that reasonable service thing is still linked to what we read before and it's not that God is making some sort of new point or Paul is making some sort of new point what if our bodies are our reasonable service just like our bodies are holy and acceptable to God right it's really cool um we've got about 15 minutes left so we're just going to recap on some uh, some other cool facets to this new creation that we are and some of the things that we have so as I mentioned just now Definitely sleeping off this. As I mentioned just now, um, we're told in Colossians 2 that in Christ, in Jesus Christ, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in Christ, all of God is there. But then we're told something even more amazing in verse 10, in my opinion. Because we're told that that same fullness of Christ that's in Christ is now in us so we now have the fullness of God right here right now as you sit here and listen to me on zoom or lying down in your bed or whatever you're doing you have the fullness of God in you and it's amazing that that's the thing um, we have 
So, so because we have that, because the fullness of God is in us, that's why we see certain phrases appear in the scriptures. Um, one of them, for example, being. Yes, Second Peter 1, uh, I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. Second Peter 1, 3 and 4. Actually, no, we'll read from 2. Uh, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power, tenses, 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 has his divine power given us given to us all things that language again we see that language of all every you're going to show you another one where it's every it's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness everything that's needed for life and godliness we have because God has given it to us in the person of Jesus because we have the fullness of God we then have things like this so we, of course we have life the same because it's the same life that was in him is now in us the same Zoe life he was transmitting is what we transmit right we are conductors of the same power that Jesus was we even <laughs> finish uh, verse 3 and 4 sorry so through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, past tense, having escaped, we already have escaped, the corruption that is in the world through lust. So going back to verse 3. All things to life and godliness everything that's everything that's needed that's required for you to live completely sin free all there everything required for you to heal the sick and raise the dead it's all there because that stuff when it comes to the power of God and that being exhibited in our lives and the miraculous that's nothing more than life being released in in whatever way shape or form so for people who you know some people experience it as like a supernatural healing we lay hands and they recover that was just a release a transmission of the Zoe life that's in us the rivers of living water that are in us it flow into them and you know and it heals them or extreme scenario um, yeah and let's move on actually <laughs> I haven't got much time um, one more I want to go to actually uh, Ephesians 1 Ephesians 1 verse 3 I've got 10 minutes Ephesians 1 3 this is one of our favourites the bang this Ephesians 1 verse 3 reads blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has 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 past tense he has blessed us every 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 not some not most not many not a few every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ so every spiritual blessing there is and could possibly be we have it 
now already because it has been blessed we we have been blessed past tense is we've been blessed with these already um and i didn't know this until what were like three it's gone up to three years now when i discovered kind of what I, I went through the new man series by curry blake and he spoke about who we are in christ you know this new creation and i was like wait, 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 wait because I know for a fact that there were pastors telling me to go up for prayer to receive a spiritual blessing from God that there will be pastors that will lay hands on you to receive spiritual blessings from God but we are told here that we already have every single spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus now why this is super dope is because how do we get it how much did we pray to earn every gift? How much did we fast? How many worship songs did we sing? How long did we intercede? We didn't. All we did was believe in all of this was given to us. Free of charge. Amazing. And it sets a tone, it sets a precedent, which I think that loads of Christians have missed. When we understand the importance of the fact that we have all of God in us and because of that we have everything that God has, then we realize that we don't need to work for certain things and that's not how God even operates because if it required work, he wouldn't have given it to us for free in the first place. He was setting the pace, he was setting the tone that this is how you're going to walk this walk with me is you receiving and I'm the one that does all the giving he's the one that gives us he gave us his son and in his son he gave us everything because his fullness is in his son and his son is in us right so every spiritual blessing in heavenly places um, all things to life and to godliness these are the things that we have because we have all of God there's a yeah I might do this and then we'll wrap up um, in John 14 we see where we'll go there real quick Jesus uh, basically predicts what's about to come in this new covenant that he's about to make us a family bring us all together bring us all into one right um and so in John 14 verses 16 through to let's say about 21-ish we see this so Jesus speaks about he speak, he is cool because he mentions all three members of the Godhead so first he says I will pray the Father so I the Son will pray the Father the Father um, and he will give you another helper Who's the other helper? It's the Spirit, of course, right? The Spirit of Christ. Which he says right there. Um, that he may abide with you forever. So the Spirit's to be with us forever. Now, it doesn't say forever until you sin. Or forever until you engage in repentant and unrepentant sin. Or forever and no strings attached. It just says what it says. It says forever. Right? That he may abide with us forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him he was talking to his disciples at the time you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you and again like I said he was prophesying about what was to come which is the resurrection and the outflowing of that and this is one of those things that flew out of that lives in us he 
leads and guides us, right? Um, now, Jesus says it in a way that's pretty cool. He says, you guys are going to recognize this spirit, by the way. It's going to be familiar to you because you've kind of been around it all this time. It's going to be like this. Right? Then, what he does in verse 18 is very, very interesting. So he's already introduced the Father and he's introduced um, the Spirit, true, the Paraclete. And then he says in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. No, that, some people even, <laughs> some people take that to mean like the second, the end times, you know, the second coming. I don't think that's the point that Jesus is making here at all. Um, I think this is Jesus talking about the fact that he was about to live in humanity, in us, in just a little while. And it, it really is amazing. Then in verse 23, then it says about um, how him and the Father, Jesus says that, he and the Father will come and make their home with us. And that was the promise, right? So Jesus there shows us that, okay, I'm going to bring the Spirit to come and live within you. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. And it's not just me. My Father's coming to you. We're going to make our home with you. And that's kind of what we then see Paul talk about in 1 Corinthians 3, which we'll go to in a second. Um... We have the Father and the Son who made their home in us. And then we have the Spirit of Truth as well. So that's the whole Godhead all together living in us. Now, we also have to remember that the way that um, the early church understood that concept of Christ was not an individualistic one where it's... Now, it's not like we don't all have the fullness of God in us. We do. Um, but it was very much understood on a corporate level as we are the body of Christ together me without you is not the body you without me is not the body but together we are the body we make up that body so um First Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. No, no, sorry, just 16. No, 16 and 17. First Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Now, the last time I brought this up, I dealt with verse 17, so you can go and listen to it to hear my explanation of it. Anyway, so do you not know you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Or temples in italics, so which you are. The temple of God is holy, which you are. Paul trying to hammer it home to the church you know you guys have you forgotten who you are you're set apart right because that's what holiness means it just means to be set apart you're set apart you're different you're you know like the rest and so we don't behave like the rest because we're not like the rest we are new creations in Christ and those creations behave a certain way which we'll probably look at we'll recap uh, maybe next week So we are completely clean now in Christ. He has cleansed us totally and utterly. There's not a shred of uncleanliness in you that we need to, you know, go grow. 
rumblings of God in prayer because oh God I'm so unclean or sing about you know Lord please make me clean or That ain't it there, man. We are new creations, cleansed, pure. That's who we are. Right? That whole the heart is wicked scripture, throw it in the bin. It's not what you are anymore. Unless you're going to get the uh, Septuagint version, which I put in the group chat, which is a totally different um, translation, which is interesting. But anyway, we are creations with new hearts the heart of stone has been removed and now we've received the heart of flesh and that's the promise that we get to enjoy that God has made us intrinsically good that's something that a lot of people not alone you know let alone Christians have like that's something they actively struggle with the idea that they are good but we are like God cleansed us it doesn't get cleaner than that like the universe's creator totally cleansed us and so when we understand that and um, you know what he's accomplished in the finished work what he's made us he's transformed us I always say the cross didn't just do something for you cross did something to you you change because you died with Christ that's our identification we identify with what Christ has done with teachings that tell us about what Christ has done um, it's just gone nine so I'm going to open there's some Q&A anybody got any questions type it in the chat Got any questions? I'm sitting on a recliner, you know. I'm not going to be that patient this time. I will lock this off and I will go straight to sleep. So if you got a question, don't be DMing me at 2 a.m. Like, oh, you know what? No, no, no. Ask it now. Okay, cool. Someone asked um, a couple more scriptures about. Holy Spirit and the blood doing the same thing. Give me a second to find it. I know I've seen it somewhere written out before. Um, yeah. And I know who wrote it.
my feelings I have to find it next week I don't know where we there was a list oh here we go here we go here we go, here we go. <coughs> so First John 5 eight. Uh, first John 5 8 and there are three that bear witness on the earth the spirit the water and the blood and these three agree as one so um, let's go to Romans 5 9 We are told that we've been justified by his blood, much more than having been having now been justified by his blood. That's Romans 5 9. Right? We've been justified by the blood. If we go to 1 Corinthians 6 11, we're told, uh, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So we have the blood that justifies in Romans 5, 9, and then we have the spirit that justifies in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. We're also told here that she did the, we were sanctified by that same spirit. And obviously we read in Hebrews that the blood is what sanctified us. Um, here again, we're washed or cleansed and verse John 1 7 Jay you know that scripture that we are cleansed by the blood right so the spirit cleanses the blood cleanses um, we eat of his sorry we eat of his flesh we drink of his blood um, and in First Corinthians 12 verse 13 we are told for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body by the Jews or Greeks, by the slaves or free and have all, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we drink the blood, we drink the spirit. Um, in Romans 3, 24, 25 justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a an atoning sacrifice uh, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness so we are called to have faith in his blood and elsewhere we're told that you know we're to have the spirit of faith so there's like the the blood of Jesus and the spirit of Christ are kind of synonymous in the scriptures in some ways um, because yeah they both do the same thing right so hopefully that answers your question obviously this is recorded so if you didn't hear those scriptures or you want to hear them again you can just check the recording on YouTube it will be up probably in like an hour and a bit because I need to um, sort out the video and everything Catch you there. Any other questions? so and so you know who you are <laughs> okay going once going twice alright we'll end it there end the recording one second